Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here and you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Today what we're going to be looking at is an exam question from a past paper, from a supplementary paper set in February, March of 2018. And essentially this question is around pedigree diagrams and genetic crosses, how to complete them correctly and how to do a genetic cross correctly. If you want to attempt the question, please go ahead and pause the video now and then we'll go through the questions, how best to approach it and at the end of the video I will be giving you the memo. So let's get into it. Now these um, diagrams you should always spend some time actually unpacking properly and labeling everything before you even attempt the question and the reason why you should do that is because it will prevent you from doing any mistaken um, quick uh, uh, calculations that often lead to you losing out on marks. Now, the problem with these pedigree diagram pictures um, and along with their questions is they're actually very simple. Um, but the reason why a lot of people get them wrong very often is because they have what I would call a domino effect. So essentially, they get a question wrong right at the beginning, and then that just impacts and it grows into a bigger issue, and that then leads it to being um, incorrect all the way through. Um, and so let's get into it, and I want to just give you some tips and tricks on how to make sure you don't make any mistakes in these kinds of genetic crosses and these pedigree diagrams. So let's have a look at what it says. It says the diagram below shows the patterns of inheritance for deafness in a family, and the letter H represents alleles for hearing, and the small h represents the allele for deafness. Now, I want to pause on this because it is at this moment that you need to decide whether or not this is a autonomic um, disorder in other words does it affect the autosomes or is it sex linked now at this moment you should already know um, straight from the introduction paragraph that this is going to be a autonomic disorder in other words, it is not linked to the X and the Y chromosomes. And the reason why I can come to that conclusion already from the onset is, number one, they normally actually tell you right at the beginning that it's sex-linked. Um, but secondly, if I actually look into the diagram, and this will then lead me into it, is that they have provided us already two sets of alleles for two individuals. And you'll notice there are no um, X's and Y's with the letters attached as a superscript to the top. And so that then means that I'm definitely not looking at a sex link disorder. But often what I find is that people don't um, actually know which one they're looking at. So the lettering does actually help us. But like I said, they often also will put this into the um, paragraph right at the beginning here. They'll actually say this is a sex linked disorder. So before we even get into answering any more of the questions, it's really important to actually spend some time studying this diagram. And what I would do is I would actually sit and fill in the genotypes of everyone on here because it's going to make my calculations go a lot faster later on and I'm less likely to make any mistakes. So we now know that deafness runs in this family and that the capital H represents the dominant allele and the small allele represents the recessive. And that if you have deafness, you probably are going to have two small letters. So in other words, let's quickly unpack this. You could have three combinations. You could be two capital H's, you could be a capital H and a small lowercase h, or you could be two small H's. So essentially what that means is all these individuals in this family is going to fall into one of these three allele groups. These first two are hearing, whereas this third is someone who is deaf. And that then allows us to now unpack who is who and who gets what lettering. Now, if we look across to our diagram, we can see here that Linda has two small letters and she's colored in, which if you see in this picture, there is no key. And I'd like you to know that whenever you see a colored in um, circle or square, it means they have the disorder. So they want you to already know that. And so that means that anybody on the sheet that has two 
that is colored in will have two lowercase h's. So what I'm going to go and do, so I don't make any mistakes, I'm going to go down to Lyle and I'm going to add in the two lowercase h's because we know for certain he is deaf. Then I look over to now John, which is the father figure in this particular family tree, and we will see here that he is heterozygous. He has a capital letter and he has a small letter. Now we need to be able to fill in their children's genotypes, Paul and Fiona. And to do that, we need to remember that when we inherit information, we get one allele from each parent. Now, we'll start with Linda because she can only give one letter, and that is a small letter H. She has nothing else to offer. So that means that Fiona is going to get one small H from her mother, and so will Paul get one small letter H. Now, what about their other letter? Well, both Paul and Fiona are hearing individuals, which means that they could not get the small h from their dad as well. So they have inherited a capital H from their dad, making them both heterozygous. Now let's look deeper into the rest of the family. Let's look at the children that are a product of Gabby and Paul. So Paul is a heterozygous individual, and they've now produced Lyle. Now, children in these um, types of questions often reveal what the parents are. So that's also a nice way to sort of, sometimes you can work backwards and you can work from the child upwards. And that sort of leads you to decide what Gabby is. Now, if Lyle is two small H's, we need to decide where he got them from. Well, he got one small H from his father. And the only other place you get the other small H from is his mother. But now, what is her other lettering? She is hearing, and so she's not colored in. So the only other option is that she is a capital H. So she's a heterozygous. And the same now for Mika. We need to figure out perhaps what Mika is. Now, um, Mika is a little bit more challenging because, in actual fact, Mika is a combination of Gabby and Paul. And as you can see here by their letterings, she could get a multiple versions. She could get two capital H's from her parents, or she could get a capital H and a small h. We know that she isn't two small letter H's, otherwise she would also be colored in and she would be deaf. And as we know, she's not colored in, so she is not deaf. So she actually has two possible alleles, but we'll see if they even ask if they need to know that. So let's go down into the questions. For 221, it says, how many of each of the following are represented in this diagram? Males. Now, yet again, they haven't given you any key, but I want everyone to know here that circles are always female and squares are always male. And then, like I mentioned to you, if the circle or the square is colored in, that represents a affected individual. So how many males do we have here? So we don't want to look at names because names are not an indication of whether they're male or female. The square or the circle is. And if we count, we have one, two, three males. The second question says, how many generations are there? And generations refer to um, sets of offspring and including the original parents. So we have one, two, and three generations in here. Right, let's go on to the next question. Two, two, two. Give the phenotype. And yet again, make sure you read that question carefully so that you don't give the genotype. They want to know what is the phenotype of John. So John is hearing because he has a capital H with a small H, but the capital H masks that so he can hear. So he is a hearing individual. And the second question in B says give the genotype of Paul. Now, we've actually already worked out what Paul's was earlier on. It was a capital H and a small h. So that work's already been done for us right at the beginning. Then let's go on to 223. It says both Lyle's parents can hear. So that's great. We now know that information. It says, yet he is deaf. Explain how this inheritance um, works. Now, that's why you actually need to sit and work out everybody's alleles because now that we've actually done that, which we've done for mom and dad up here, for Gabby and Paul, we now know their alleles and we also know what Lyle's alleles are. So we can now describe that Lyle 
has inherited a recessive allele from his mother and a recessive allele from his father, and therefore the combination of those two small uh, lowercase recessive alleles has resulted in Lyle being deaf, whereas his parents are heterozygous, and therefore they can hear. Now, that's a very long explanation I've given you, but you can shorten it up because it's only for two marks. And essentially, for those two marks, you're telling me where each of the alleles came from. One from mom, one from dad. Now, last but not least, we are going to look at question four, which is the genetic cross. It says, Lyle marries a woman who is homozygous dominant for hearing. Use a genetic cross to show the percentage chance of them having a deaf child. Now, before you dive straight into answering this, make sure you actually write in what everyone's alleles are. So we know that Lyle is two small H's, so we're just going to write that right above Lyle, and that he's having children with a woman. And she's homozygous, which means both of her letters need to be capitals or both of them need to be lowercase. Now, it says dominant, which means that she then needs to have two capital H's because in this example hearing is dominant and so now what you need to do is you need to create a full genetic cross which I'll reveal to you in the memo that's going to be straight after this and I'm going to point out where our marks go but in particular something that we often forget is the rest of this question which says the percentage in other words they want to know what are the chances of them having a deaf child? So let's have a look at the memo, because um, that's drawn out quite nicely, and I can show you how it all works. So here's the memo, and you can go ahead and have a look at these previous sets of questions that we've already done. But I want to just draw your attention to the um, genetic cross, and I want to show you what you're actually getting marks for. So it depends. You can either do a um, line diagram to work this out, or a Punnett square. Um, this is an or, so you can choose which one you want to work with. It uh, really doesn't matter which one you choose. I suggest to my students to always use a Punnett square, which is this bottom one here, and that's because it's more easier, it's more user-friendly. And so I'm just going to work with that lower example, but if you use the top example of the line graph, that's also correct. So I want to have a look at some of the things you get marks for. So the first thing is writing the genotype of the parents. So you have a hearing person with a deaf person, and we wrote out the genotypes of Lyle and his future wife. We then have our Punnett square, which we drew out here, and you get one mark for the correct gametes and one mark for the correct genotypes. In other words, you're getting a mark for all of these, and they all have to be correct. Now, there's two bonus marks that I want to point out to everybody that you must never forget, and that is you must always have a P1 and F1. And so here is the P1 representing parental generation and the F1, which represents filial, which means offspring. And then another little bonus mark is this meiosis and fertilization. And you need to make sure that you put it in the right place. Now, um, in this picture here, they sort of offset them to the side. Um, that's because of the marking and the way the marker looks for these. But I know that some of you may have already learned in class that you write meiosis over here. And then straight below it, you'll write the gametes and then fertilization. The point is, meiosis must come first, fertilization must come second. So don't get too caught up on the memo over here. Um, it's just to guide the actual marker. Now, you will so notice something also very important in this question. If you look a little lower down, it says that the phenotype are all hearing and therefore 0% deaf. Remember, that was a part of our question. We had to say percentage. And you'll see in the marking, it says there's one compulsory mark and then any other six marks. And so what that means is, is that you can get any six marks, but you have to give this percentage to get seven out of seven. So it's a compulsory mark. And that's because they explicitly asked for it. So it doesn't matter if you got all other seven or eight things right. If you don't give this final compulsory piece here, which is how many are deaf, you can't get seven out of seven. All right, everybody, um, if you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I have a YouTube video that explains pedigree diagrams, which I've linked at the beginning of this video as well as at the end if you'd like to take a look at it to brush up on your skills. And I will see you next time. Bye.